Good morning. I'm Crystal Haling, a member of the CEP Board of Directors, and I'm very excited to have the honor of introducing our next session and our next speaker. Our conversations so far have touched on many, many challenges for foundations. The challenge of being effective, the challenge of effectiveness to what end, and the challenge of leadership. But complicating all of these challenges, and this leadership in particular, is according to our next speaker, is the profound shifting of power dynamics. It is a shift that according to Henry Timms and his co-author in a widely discussed Harvard Business Review article published in December, a shift that tends to be either wildly romanticized or dangerously underestimated. Henry Timms and Jeremy Hyman's article in HBR, which I've just quoted from, has struck such a chord that they are now working on a major book about new power. But Henry is not some consultant or ivory tower academic here to tell us how to do our work better or differently in a way that is disconnected from the on the ground realities. He is instead really on the ground. He's the executive director of a 141 year old iconic institution in the nonprofit sector, the 92nd Street Y. With a budget of over $60 million, 92Y is one of the largest community and cultural centers in New York City. Put another way, Henry knows how hard all this work really is. Under his leadership, 92nd Street Y is reimagining the role of the traditional community center, using innovative programming and new technology both locally and globally. Henry oversees the organization's 40 plus businesses, including critically acclaimed performing and visual arts programs, a world renowned series of talks and readings, a huge range of family and wellness programming, professional development opportunities, and more. In addition, Henry founded Giving Tuesday, hashtag Giving Tuesday. Um, Giving Tuesday is a wonderful example of new power in action because it engages more than 27,000 partners in a global day of giving, an action that brings people together who've never met. Henry himself has also received numerous honors for his work, including the Nonprofit Times Influencer of the Year in 2014. This year, he was named one of Kane's of Cranes New York Business 40 Under 40 honorees. Henry is also a practitioner in residence at Stanford Down the Road, the University Center of Philanthropy and Civil Society. One of the things I appreciate about Henry's work is its nuance. He's not here to tell us that old power is dead because he doesn't think it is. Nor will he tell us that the solution to all of our problems lies in technology because he knows it doesn't. But it's all much, much more complicated than that, and it's a melding, especially for us as foundations, bringing together all those features and figuring out how we can mobilize our resources in different ways. Henry will challenge us to think about where we are on the old power, new power continuum. And in the final analysis, all of this is about what it takes to make change a reality. That's why this all matters. And that's why I'm so excited to have Henry here today with us and to introduce him to share his thoughts about what it takes to engage, to mobilize, and to accentuate the new power. Thanks, Henry. Uh, thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today. I've uh, really enjoyed uh, the conference so far, and, and like all of us, learn a lot. So when we think about the future, the, the frame we most often use is 2.0, right? Education, 2.0, social justice, 2.0, philanthropy, 2.0. Um, I want to start by showing you something. Uh, this is Microsoft 1.0. <laughs> Are you ready? This is Microsoft 2.0. Let's do this once more. That's Microsoft 1.0. Here is Microsoft 2.0. I think too often we actually take a 2.0 response to how the world is changing. What we say is the world is changing, so we need a layer more technology. We need to do the same things we've already done, but we need to layer on top of them a bit more technology. So we look at the world changing and we say the change we are facing can be approached if we think incrementally, 
and if we think technologically. If we just shift from 1.0 to 2.0, then we'll keep in line. I'll argue today that that's the wrong frame to think about the future, and let me start with a story which I hope illustrates what I mean. So one of the great things about being a nonprofit professional is you get to go fundraising in New York City. Um, for those who haven't done that, it is a full contact sport. Um, <laughs> So every year, I go and see one of the major foundations in New York, and I talk about technology, and I talk about peer-based projects, and I talk about new power, and I talk about all the ways that 92nd Street Y is doing this in exciting ways, and they smile, and they nod, and they say nice things, and they refuse to give me any money. It's an annual tradition. It's gone on for a number of years. This year was different. I went into the foundation and they knew what was coming. They knew I was going to come in and talk about technology and peer-based mutualism. And before I got a chance to kick off about how we were reimagining the community center, I was taken aside and said, you've got to meet someone. And I walked down this long corridor. And at the end of the corridor, a door opened. I walked through the door and they said, here, this is our chief digital officer. They will solve these problems. I think that's a 2.0 response. Right? I think what we're doing when we're thinking about the future, we've talked a lot about leadership, and in this room we have leaders of many, many important organizations. We sometimes delegate the idea of thinking about technology. We feel better because we hire a chief information officer or a chief digital officer or someone who used to work at Twitter or someone who used to work at Facebook or a consultant. And that person becomes our digital beard. It becomes the person who comes in and says, I will deal with these things on behalf of your foundation, thus the leadership need not change. Now, I think we need to be very careful about thinking how the world is changing. And the argument I will make today, which is based on work I've been doing with my colleague, Jeremy Hymans, who ran organizations and set up organizations like uh, Avaz and GetUp and now runs Purpose around the world. The argument we're making is what's really changing is not technology, but power. Uh, now, you know some of these dynamics behind what's changing in the world. Uh, you know that half the world is 30 or younger. You know that there are more cell phones than people. You know that there are three billion with a B smartphones in the world. You know all those trends are happening. And those te technological trends, in our argument, are leading to some profound human changes. And that profound human change, we tried to put a framework together that would help practitioners more clearly understand what's really shifting. Right? Jeremy and, and I, neither of us are thought leaders. We both spend our time working in organizations. Uh, we deal with the revenues, we deal with the costs, we deal with the fundraising. But the way we wanted to try and get people to think about the world was not 1.0 or 2.0, but a world that is shifting from a set of behaviors which we can think of as old power to a set of behaviors that we can think of as new power. So in the old power world, power was a currency. It's zero sum. I've got it, you haven't. In the new power world, power is a current. You never truly own it, but if you can shape its flow, you have extraordinary influence. In the old power world, power was held by few. In the new power world, we see it made by many. In the old power world, our instinct was to download. Right? We downloaded things onto the world. In the new power world, the great skill is to upload, to solicit the ideas and the advice and the support and the enthusiasm of others. In the old power world, our default was to command. We said things should be this way. In the new power world, we're trying to shift people to think more about how we share. Uh, we talked yesterday about this. In the old power world, we have a philosophy that is very much leader-driven. Uh, in the new power world, we are developing a philosophy which is very much about peer-driven. And in the old power world, of course, our feeling was always to have things closed, right? To close things up. We've talked a lot over the last two days about an instinct to close up, uh, to not let things in. The new power world is forcing us and encouraging us to try to open. So as you see the combination of two things uh, emerging in the world, one, mass participation, uh, two, uh, peer coordination. When you see mass participation and peer coordination coming together, what you're beginning to see is a rise in new power. But here's three things I want to start by saying new power is not. Uh, number one, uh, new power is not your Facebook page. Uh, too often, uh, we think, right, we've got to understand technology. Let's get the Facebook page up and running. Let's make sure we're on Periscope, and all will be well with the world. Uh, new Power is not your Facebook page. Number two, I don't think this could be more important for this group. Uh, new Power is not inherently positive. Uh, we are in the part of the world uh, that allows a philosophy, too often, that says, 
everything will be perfect. We will innovate, we'll innovate ourselves to a utopia, right? More participation will mean, will mean better outcomes. The world will be more perfect. But the people in this room know because you spent your careers focusing on things of great complexity and great wisdom, you know fully well that in the new power world, the things that are most viral are not necessarily the things that are most strategic. No better example. It is very hard, it is very hard to build an effective new power campaign around deworming initiatives. It is very easy to build a new power campaign around cats. So the new power world, I think, is not inherently positive. This is not going to lead in a very, very positive place. This is a flippant comment. I'll make a less flippant comment. Uh, new power also is exhibiting itself right now in things like ISIS. You see the way in which uh, some of the worst actors in the world are taking mass participation and peer coordination and using those to very, very evil and negative ends. Third thing, new power is not, to the same point. New power is not the inevitable victor, right? There is an easy and lazy argument that says those in the castles will be toppled, the crowds will take over, right? Everything will crumble. Uh, that is not what is going to happen. What we believe is going to happen is actually something much more nuanced, that the world will shift in a way that we will see much more blending between the worlds of old and new power. It will not be either or, but those organizations who are best positioned, and I think this couldn't be more important for the foundation world, those people who are best positioned will be those who can deploy both. Those organizations who can truly be blended power organizations, who have the capacity to not just pull on old power levers, but to launch new power movements. So one of the ways we started to try and think about this in a way to help practitioners is to say, with all of these changes taking place and all of these new ideas coming up in the world, how could you think about how values are shifting? And along with the way of thinking about kind of what behaviors we see in old and new power, we also think about what kind of values are changing in the old and new power world. So on the left-hand side here, we see our old power values. Uh, tell me if any of these sound familiar to the foundation world. Managerialism, exclusivity, Discretion, confidentiality, professionalism, long-term affiliation, less overall participation. You think about a lot of the biggest brands of the last century, they're based on those behaviors. Uh, then think about the other side of this. Think about these new power values that are emerging. Informal opt-in decision-making, open source collaboration, crowd wisdom, sharing. We've heard so much over the last two days about radical transparency. Right? We see how this group of new power values are emerging, especially things like a do-it-ourselves maker culture, conditional affiliation. And what we begin to see is, I think, a very interesting challenge to institutions. And I say that running an 141-year-old institution. I don't say these things as a consultant. I don't say these things as someone who works for a technology company. I run a big old power institution in New York City. And the thing that we are trying to deal with on a daily basis now is a generation of people are emerging in our work who have a very different set of values than the ones which have served us well for a very long time. And that is a set of new power values. And a new generation who we are all trying to engage with, and I'm pleased actually, this conference has scored very well on not talking about millennials too much, um, which is a great success on the conference circuit. Um, but nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, the millennials, as they come up, a next generation of people uh, are growing up with something of an expectation of participation. They believe they have an inalienable right to participate in the world. And I want to tell you a story I heard last night from my wife about my three-year-old son, which made that point very well to me. So, my son uh, was going to, work, going to school yesterday. You can tell he's a New York City child because he was going to school in his Uber. So he's going, in, he's going to school, he's three and a half years old, in his Uber with his grandfather who is visiting. So his grandfather is in the, in the back with my son. They're going across the park. Um, and this is conveyed by text to my wife. Uh, Josiah, my son, keeps asking the driver for the wrecking song. And so Josiah, my son, has said, and I'm very proud of this, he said, excuse me, Mr. Uber, which is how he refers to the Uber driver, excuse me, Mr. Uber, do you have the wrecking song, please? Of course, the Uber driver is confused, and my father is confused, and everyone is confused. In the manner of three-year-olds, this didn't just come up once. 
So for the entire journey, there was this ongoing conversation about the wrecking song and what it was, and Josiah ended slightly disappointed that this hadn't happened. Uh, once Colleen, my wife, texted me, I knew exactly what this was, which is uh, on my cell phone, which is in my pocket, um, there is a functionality now which ties Spotify to Uber, which means when I'm going to work in the mornings and dropping off my son at the nursery school, I have a capacity to play his favorite song via my iPhone on the stereo system of the Uber. And my son's favorite song is Wrecking Ball by Miley Cyrus. <laughs> so anytime we are going to work, and he, he goes to our nursery school, so we go to work at the same place, he knows that on demand he can cue the wrecking song, uh, Miley Cyrus' Wrecking Ball. So what is interesting about this story isn't just I like telling stories about my son, for which I will make no apologies, but a generation of people who just expect to participate. My son at three and a half years old expects not just because he's a New York City child, but because the world is changing so much, he expects to have a more meaningful participation in the world around him. I think that trend is gonna continue, and I think it's gonna be a really interesting challenge and opportunity to everyone in this room. So as old and new power play out, I wanted to finish the first section, and we're gonna have a lot of time today to talk in groups and do some exercises. I wanted to finish with something of a kind of sketch of the world in terms of how old and new power are playing out. Now, as it was mentioned earlier, we wrote a piece for Harvard Business Review. Uh, you actually aren't allowed to write a piece for Harvard Business Review unless at some point you do a two by two matrix of some kind. <laughs> That's just a hint, anyone who's trying to get published. So of course we did ours. Here is our two by two matrix. And what we are trying to do with this matrix is start to think about how these two different set of dynamics are playing out. The first set going up the side here, where am I, I hit perfect. The first set going up the side here, we think about the model, right? So what of these organizations have a model that is encouraging and providing for old or new power? Along the bottom here, we have a set of values. So which of these organizations are deploying old and new values in the work that they do? So I wanna just talk through a couple of examples uh, from our matrix here. Let's start with an easy one and something of a cheap shot, which is the Obama campaign, right? So we all remember the Obama campaign was a kind of quintessential new power effort. It began with, yes, we can. It was about, we are the change we are waiting for. It deployed new power in ways which today are unrivaled in the way that it engaged people around the country and in a way uh, that it eventually outflanked the old power Clinton Rolodex. But by the time the Obama campaign hit office and Van Jones spoke so well to this yesterday, all that new power didn't go where everyone thought it would go, right? By the time he got to office, uh, he defaulted from the top right quadrant, which is what we think of as crowds, people really deploying new power, down to the bottom left. The old power realities of Washington meant that it was actually very hard to take that mass participation and turn it into policy in an interesting way. Uh, another example, Let's take the top left, the connectors, and these are these organizations we see as those who have amazing new power models, um, but really tend to default to old power values. Let's go back to our friends Uber a moment ago. Uber has the most extraordinary new power model. Right? They are really finding powerful ways of engaging with their drivers, with their uh, riders, all around the world, and we all know the power that they're having, but one of the big challenges for Uber is with all that power in their model, they tend to seem to default to this set of old power values, right? The value they create, uh, they're in this tense relationship with their network participants. Those people who they rely on for that kind of revenue are not fully engaged in their mission. Uh, another example, uh, less acute right now, but a challenging one is Facebook. So you think about Facebook, 1.3 billion people around the world every single day contribute their data to Facebook. They share, they engage, and it is creating huge amounts of revenue Facebook is really challenged because on one level, they have investors to manage. On the other level, they have a community to manage. And they have to walk a very fine line between working out how it is that they can serve that network that they rely on. So we see some interesting challenges in the top left here, which is those organizations who have deployed new power brilliantly to make huge amounts of money and to raise huge amounts of money. The next question for all of them is, are they going to take their crowds with them? Uh, every now and then we see more and more interesting efforts of people trying to create social networks where the value is shared with the participants. We see the same thing in taxis too. It's not in inconceivable to imagine a model whereby a city or a state says, 
we're going to have our own Uber. And our Uber is going to return money to our state. So as we look further out with some of these interesting challenges, one of the interesting challenges, particularly here in Silicon Valley, is how those organizations who have a massive new power networks better deploy their new power values. Uh, let me finish with one more example, and then we'll lead to an exercise. So the bottom right-hand corner here is what we think of as the cheerleaders. So these are those organizations who you get that sense that in their soul they are trying to find their way to new power, but are still working on developing their model. Uh, I, I suspect a lot of the foundation world and certainly a lot of the philanthropic world would find themselves in this chasm. So what they're really trying to do is say, look, I understand this world is changing, but we are all experimenting in how we build new models. And I wanted to share a couple of examples of that. This is the Guardian, uh, which I had. You see the Guardian down here is our cheerleader, right? So they're kind of... Uh, an organization who still pretty much have an old power model, but they have some pretty impressive new power values and how they're trying to connect and how they're trying to engage. They just started th two weeks ago inside their journalism to have petitions, right? So the very nature of their journalism, which was a download model, right? The Guardian was smart. They said smart things. People consumed them. Inside their journalism now, they are designing for participation. So they're trying to find a model that says that journalism alone, which is I've created my piece of content and you have consumed it, will not go far enough for a new power generation. What they're trying to do is say, I need to build movements around the content I care about most. Right? I think that's a really important idea from today, which is I need to build movements around the content I care about most. And I think that's going to be an important challenge for everyone in this room. Another example from last week, this is a picture of a bee. What's interesting about this picture is this is a New York Times picture, and New York Times has just started actually publishing first some articles in the Facebook feed, right? So they're published first. Now, this is actually a photograph from inside a much longer article about bees. And what's interesting about this piece of content is just look at the architecture of this, this design here, right? So this is journalism. This is a piece of content they're putting out in the world. You see share, you see like, you see comment, you see photographer's commentary. What they're beginning to do is say, our idea of just downloading on the world will not take us where we need to do. We need to start building movements around the things we care about most. So as we look out to the future, I think one of the interesting challenge we all have as people running institutions is our first exercise today. And here is our first exercise. Our first exercise, and you all have in front of you a copy of the new power matrix. Uh, here is our first set of questions to be discussed at our tables, and we'll give it about 10 to 15 minutes for this conversation. Question number one, as an institution, where are you now? Question number two, as an institution, where do you want to be in five years? Question number three, how are you going to get there? Uh, a bonus question, if anyone gets through all of those threes, three, what about your grantees? Where are they, where are they going, and how can you help get them there? Uh, we will recommence in 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you. All right, so here are some things, here are some things uh, I, I heard from some of the tables, uh, which, which I think are interesting. But before that, let me ask one question. Um, who here plans to move their strategic position over the next five years? Hands in the air if you're planning to move. All right. Hands in the air if you're staying where you are. Two. Right. <laughs> Bra brave, brave souls, quite right. Um, Interesting challenge, right? Think about how hard it is going to be from an institutional perspective if you're trying to move from point A to point B. Think how big that change is and think how much that change isn't about technology. Right? Think how that change is not being defined by technology. It's defined by a set of values and behaviors that are going to be so much bigger than who happens to be your chief innovation officer and actually will be a lot to do with who is leading your organization. Uh, we heard a lot earlier yesterday about leaders not mattering in the same way. I actually don't agree with that in this case. Uh, I think organizations can pretty much in this world move about as fast as their leaders can. Uh, and their leaders change, uh, the organizations can change. If the leaders don't change, how could the organizations change? Some things I heard from the audience, this was very fun. Um, so someone said to me, I have a pointer here, which is good. Someone said to me, just here is my chair, chair of my board, right? <laughs> just here is my board, and here am I, <laughs> right? And I heard from a number of people that the first instinct was, how new power is your board, right? Who here has a new power thinker, one or more new power thinkers on their board? All right, so that looks like about a fifth, right? about a fifth. So everybody else, we are assuming, everyone has a board. Everyone else does not have any kind of new power thinking on their board, which is interesting. Who has new power thinkers on their staff? A lot more, all right? Interesting challenge, which is this, and well pointed out by the comment earlier, 
People and their organizations and their staff are not necessarily aligned on this. A couple more interesting comments. Number one, uh, crowds are dumb, right? One comment, brave soul here said, <laughs> crowds, crowds are not wise. There is no wisdom in crowds. Uh, what, what do you want us to do? Give all this money away by your crowdsourcing? Um, Interesting, interesting comment. One, two interesting comment was someone saying, we've become a more new power institution, not because of our board or our staff, but because our constituents are forcing us in that direction. Right. Really interesting response. And one other comment which I thought really stuck with me was someone was saying, we have to resist the temptation to lurch all the way across this screen. Right? The foundation world, for all the many old power strengths, uh, we should be very proud of the professionalism, the level of expertise, the experience, the dedication, so many of the things that are the great old power strengths of the philanthropic world, we mustn't abandon in the chase for virality. So one of the big challenges I think we have as a group and as an industry is how we find our place to stand for the next five years. And I would argue that that's going to be a very tough and very fundamental challenge for all of our organizations here, which is recalibrating our relationships with power. So let me finish now uh, to the second exercise, which is to talk a little bit from a practical perspective. I got into trouble with one of our group here who said um, it was funny, but you shouldn't have drawn a distinction between practitioner and thought leader, right? If you're a good practitioner, you should be a good thought leader as well. Um, so I want to accept that criticism. I thought that was quite right too. So as a practitioner, I thought I would talk through how we built Giving Tuesday um, from a new power perspective. So remember, I run an old power institution, we're 141 years old. I'm gonna talk you through the design principles behind Giving Tuesday, which I hope give a sense of how we can begin to think about building movements uh, from old power standing grounds. So you know about Black Friday, you know about Cyber Monday. Our intention here was after Black Friday and Cyber Monday, could we unite the philanthropic community? Could we bring people together from all different nonprofits, foundations, corporations, blood drives, coat drives, financial drives. Could we get people working together on one project around hashtag Giving Tuesday on December the 1st or 2nd, depending which year it is? And we launched that less than three years ago, and we've seen some progress over the last couple of years. So 68 countries have had Giving Tuesday efforts. Uh, 27,000 partners have taken part. We think that will be 50,000 this year. 15.4 billion uh, impressions in terms of the media reach. And we saw some interesting data on the cash as well. The average donation on Giving Tuesday online is 40% bigger than any other day in that period. Um, the increase in online giving is going up uh, by double digits every year. And we saw a huge increase in mobile transactions on Giving Tuesday. Uh, Blackboard measured 15% of all the giving they saw via mobile phones. We didn't expect that number. So Giving Tuesday is beginning to grow and we can talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions later in the day about Giving Tuesday uh, in other senses. But I wanna talk today about Giving Tuesday as a movement and talk about how we designed it. So one of the things we tried to capture in the HBR piece was something we call the participation scale, which is to say that when you think about building new power, what you're really trying to do is push agency away from you as an institution. The real trick to building new power movements is actually to get away the agency and feed the agency of others. And the old power world actually relies on a very low level of participation, right? In the old power world, most institutions won't ask much more of you than your consumption. Uh, my favorite newspaper in the world is The Economist. Right? The Economist is extraordinary. It is well loved. It is thorough. It is witty. What is the one question The Economist asks me most often? Will you renew your subscription? Right? That's, the converse, that's what they ask of me as a consumer. They are not asking me to be part of a movement in a meaningful way. They're not asking me to ally to their ideas. They have this huge and passionate base, but their most frequent question is around subscription. So when we think about building new power models, what we're always trying to do is actually push the behavior changes and get those people who believe in the things we believe in further up this scale. So I'm going to talk through each of these levels using some examples from Giving Tuesday. So the first is sharing. Okay, so sharing other people's content and ideas. Um, this is a photo from us at the first meeting we had about Giving Tuesday, actually here uh, at Facebook. And in that first meeting, we had both the incoming and the outgoing heads of the Hewlett Foundation. We had three 19-year-old coders, and we had a group of people in the middle. So we actually had this real kind of diversity of different voices. And before this idea was even out of the box, we started convening people and simply saying, what do you think about this idea? How could we make it more effective? And what could you do to make it happen? 
So from the start of Giving Tuesday, our design wasn't spend a year and a half at the 92nd Street Y plotting and then announce this on the world. Our design from first principles was to say, you start movements as movements. You begin them by listening to the people you want to enlist. And what this meant is this is just one we held during the summer of 2012. We must have held 15 events around the country, bringing people together in person from all different fields to think about how you would grow something like Giving Tuesday. And from those meetings, the strategy of the whole movement emerged. So this is just uh, eight of the ideas, 10 of the ideas we had at one meetup. But the whole strategy of Giving Tuesday came not from us at the 92nd Street Y, where it began. It came from the community we were trying to build. And the reason for that is we were committed from day one to shifting the agency away from the center and meaningfully putting it out into the field. So with that basis, what you began to see was people would grab Giving Tuesday and make it their own and feel a lot of ownership over other people's ideas. So this was Pencils of Promise. The Gates Foundation did some good research for us, and this was actually the most powerful piece of social media of the whole movement. Around Pencils of Promise, getting people to retweet for Ghana. Uh, we saw a lot of celebrities grab the idea of Giving Tuesday and make it meaningful in their own terms. We saw people like Malala get behind Giving Tuesday and talk to her value set about why this is important. And what we began to see throughout the philanthropic world was different people taking the same theme and using it as a shared umbrella to talk about shared strength. Beyond sharing is shaping. So shaping is this idea that actually not just sharing other people's contents, but actually making it a bit more personal. So starting to change the content and make it even more about you. So what we began to see with Giving Tuesday is people were grabbing bits of the idea and turning it into something more meaningful for them. So this was where the unselfie came from. So as part of Giving Tuesday, someone said, instead of taking selfies, we should take unselfies, right? We should take pictures of ourselves doing good things from the world. They pushed it out via social media. It caught on virally. Within 10 days of that idea taking place, the Secretary of State at the time, John Kerry, was taking his own unselfie. Really interesting idea that an idea not created by us at the center, created by a community member, was then fed to the community. The community grabbed the idea and started to remix it and started to adapt it. The reason that happened was they felt they had permission to share. And two of the things we need to think about a lot is have we given people permission to shape and have we given people permission to share? This was in Canada, I love this, this was the buses in Canada. So Giving Tuesday spread to Canada, um, and someone there, again, this is nobody we know, uh, someone there did a deal with the bus company saying this would be a meaningful way of telling the story of Giving Tuesday. There's a prize for anyone who can tell me who this man is, which no one will ever claim. This is the mayor of Batesville, Arkansas. <laughs> so, now we're all friends here, so let's not tell this story outside this room, but we had lined up the mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, to be the first mayor in the nation to declare it Giving Tuesday, right? This would be good for the 92nd Street Y. It was helpful for us politically. We had the whole press release ready. Three o'clock the day before the press release hits, announcing Mayor Bloomberg first mayor in nation to declare it Giving Tuesday. This arrives via social media. <laughs> so Mayor Bloomberg, not that enthusiastic about the press release being the second mayor to declare it Giving Tuesday. Now, of course, in the old power world, this is a disaster and everyone ought to be fired. In the new power world, <laughs> In the new power world, this is a sign that things are happening, right? It's a sign that things are going in the right direction. And you will hear a lot of people in our sector right now talking about movements. They'll say, I'm launching a movement to do this, I'm launching a movement to do that. There is one test in my mind of whether or not you have a movement. Does it move? <laughs> if it moves without you, it's a movement. Otherwise, it's just a social media initiative. So as we get beyond shaping, we get to the really interesting part and something which is interesting particularly for this community, which is funding, right? So the funding behaviors we saw around Giving Tuesday. And what we began to see again with this permission to share and to fund and to, and to invent around the idea of Giving Tuesday, we saw some really interesting funding achievements. So the Methodist Church, their biggest online giving day ever before had been $400,000 after a disaster. They united their global ministries, used matching funds, and told stories about how local people could help local causes in a very kind of decentralized, very new power way. In one day, they raised $6.5 million online. Right. Biggest day before was 400,000. They got it to $6.5 million online. Uh, this was the Gates Foundation, who did a very fun activation, which first thing in the morning, they did a door buster, right? So you know on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, they have door busters. This was a philanthropic door buster, right? So the first things launched in the morning would be matched. Uh, and this was a really interesting story which ties to our friend Rob Reich from Stanford, who was on a Slate podcast with Felix Salmon. And so Felix Salmon does a great podcast on Slate. At the very end of the podcast, Rob, uh, because he is a good Giving Tuesday ambassador, says, well, Felix, Giving Tuesday is coming up soon. And Felix says, without thinking about it, well, you know what? 
if anyone wants to give some money to Doctors Without Borders from my community, um, I'll match your funds. $91,000. He matched 20 or 25 himself. All the rest came in because just that passing comment, as he gave that community permission to engage, as you gave them that context to engage, you began to see people getting behind a shared cause. And then when we get to the top of this participation scale, and this is where I think really interesting things begin to happen, we get to the two behaviors I think are the hardest to get and the most meaningful. The first is producing which is people who start to actually create assets in the context of your movement. So this is people who aren't just sharing your ideas or saying, hey, come do this cool thing, Giving Tuesday. This is people who, of their own accord, start to create assets that actually strengthen the whole community. So this was in New Jersey last year. Uh, the Jewish organizations, all of the Jewish organizations in New Jersey, came together to produce a day-long challah bakeathon. For 24 hours, they baked challah, right, to support a collective community of people around Jewish causes around Giving Tuesday. Uh, this was a giving tower. This is a holographic giving tower that you could view via your iPhone, which you could see. And by the end of the day, it had grown bigger than the Empire State building built by CrowdRise. Right? So what you begin to see with Giving Tuesday is people actually riffing off it and creating content that strengthens the whole community. And most interesting, I think, from my perspective, was this, which is what Giving Tuesday became with no one trying to make this happen. This was never an intention of ours. It became a connected learning experience. What started to happen is people started to produce assets to help other people. So people would say, here's a webinar on how you can use social media to drive your causes. Here's how you think about geo-targeting. Here's how you think about collaborating with other people. So Giving Tuesday began, 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 is, is still going, but it's really becoming a world where people are creating these assets as part of a movement with no sense of the central ownership. They are feeling a lot of agency in what happens. And because that is happening, we're getting to where we really want to end up, which is co-ownership. And Carol Larson earlier was talking about the importance of this community co-creating together. I will go further and say there is importance in us co-owning together, which is actually creating things that other people can own as much as you. So this project, which began its life here at the 92nd Street Y in New York City, then began to become very meaningful to people in other places. So this is uh, Giving Blue Day, right? The University of Michigan, do we have any University of Michigan people here? We have a lot. So the University of Michigan, this is, this is great. University of Michigan turns Giving Tuesday into Giving Blue Day, right? Old power world, we're calling our lawyers at this point, right? You're saying cease and desist, de cease and desist. you screwed with my brand. Uh, new power world, this is what's supposed to happen, right? Because they've taken this and they genuinely have a co-ownership stake. Their target was $1 million. Uh, the reason they got to $3.2 million was because they got every member of their community engaged as a fundraiser on that day from their staff to their president to their alums. They built a community around their fundraising team. Right, really important idea. Uh, this was Baltimore. So two years ago, Baltimore declared as a city they were gonna come together and become the most generous city in America on Giving Tuesday. They thought they could raise $5 million in a day, which they did, and they had everything from major philanthropists making gifts through to local pizza parlor making special pizza on the day where a percentage of proceeds went to local nonprofits. Last year, they expanded Baltimore into Maryland, made $9 million. They'll come back again next year and they'll get into double digits. And what's so interesting about this is they actually turned it from Giving Tuesday into Be More Gives More, Right, so they've completely subsumed the brand. You can see it's just there at the bottom. And then Be More Gives More has now turned into Marilyn Gives More. So what you're beginning to see is this really interesting behavior that we should all encourage more, which is if there is a big issue you care about deeply, and everyone in this room has those issues, how are you encouraging co-ownership around the things you care about most? So as Giving Tuesday grows, that co-ownership is now going global in some interesting ways. So it was the biggest online giving day uh, in the history of Israel. Uh, giving Tuesday in the UK now uh, was very significant last year and will grow even more this year. In Singapore, Giving Tuesday launches a week of giving. Uh, giving Tuesday is kind of the launch date of a whole week of giving, which actually includes a lot of food and philanthropy around food. So what's beginning to happen with Giving Tuesday and our goal here is to see if we can create a movement that proves that no matter what may divide us, we are all capable of caring for one another. That's the goal of Giving Tuesday is to get to that kind of scale. And what we've learned along the way with Giving Tuesday is three really big lessons. Uh, lesson number one, this is uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. So there is a wonderful piece in one of the Conan Doyle novels where, what, where Holmes turns to Watson and says to Watson, Watson, you are not luminous, but from time to time you are a conductor of light. You are not luminous, but from time to time you are a conductor of light. Every time Giving Tuesday worked, it worked because someone was behaving like Watson, not Holmes. 
right? They were behaving as someone who didn't need to be luminous. They wanted to be a conductor of light. They wanted to bring together the people in Maryland. They wanted to bring together the people in Michigan. They wanted to bring together the Jewish community in New Jersey. The people who drove Giving Tuesday were not all about being the superstars. They were people who wanted as leaders to be conductors of light. Movements rely on people who can be conductors of light. And I think the philanthropic and particularly the foundation sector can play a huge role there. Uh, too many times we make all of our investments in the Sherlocks. These amazing individuals with their compelling narratives, their personal stories, and their moving videos, they aren't necessarily the best agents of change. So number one learning from Giving Tuesday is every time we made a bet on, we made a bet on people who would behave like Watson, not Holmes. Lesson number two was around tools, not rules. One of the big new power ideas for our perspective was our default, which is telling people what they can't do. Right? As movement makers, we're always in danger of telling people what they can't do. How do we tell people what they can do? So Erin Sheridan, who at the UN Foundation was responsible for a lot of the communication strategy for around Giving Tuesday, in one of the best things I saw around the campaign, he put together a toolkit which allowed local people to go on TV and tell the Giving Tuesday story. Right? So the old power version of this story would be one central individual goes on television and talks about Giving Tuesday and how great they are and how they invented it and aren't they tremendous. The new power story is how do you get people all over the country pitching themselves to TV? And on Giving Tuesday last year, in 50 different media markets across the country, representatives of the philanthropic community got on TV with the same set of talking points and told the Giving Tuesday story. Uh, lesson number three. Big third lesson from Giving Tuesday, mission over brand. Now, this is a challenging idea for a lot of us, uh, and I say so especially in the combative world of New York nonprofit fundraising. But uh, there is no one in this room whose mission statement says they need to be more famous. There is no one in this room whose mission statement says their CEO should be on TV. Uh, yet, think about the behaviors on any given week that you have in the office, and think about how much time you are spending on mission and how much time you are spending over brand. And is your default Brand or mission? Are you defaulting to brand or mission? Now, I have to raise a bunch of money in New York City, so mission and brand both matter to me, but there is a challenge for those in the philanthropic community to say, how much does brand really matter? How, how much does it really matter if you don't get the credit? Right? What, what is the benefit of that credit to your organization? Now, there are some good answers to that question. I'm not saying there are no good answers. There are definitely brand benefits to the foundation world. But I would argue one thing we learned from Giving Tuesday was we got so much more done because we were prepared to not take the credit. We were never trying to say there has to be our initiative on our terms. It was always about the thing that 92nd Street Y believes in, which is we want to create community. We want to repair the world. We believe in families. We believe in philanthropy. And if that happens all over the country, and maybe one day happens all over the world, even if we don't get credit, that's a very, very good day in the office. So, here's the next exercise. Imagine for the next five years, you have exactly the same mission and the same staff, but you can't issue a single grant. What are you gonna do for the next five years to meet your mission? Same staff, right? Same mission, you can't do any grant giving. What are you gonna do for the next five years to best meet your mission? Let's have 10 minutes on that. But to finish up, I thought I'd talk just very briefly about my organization. So one of the questions I was just asked was, how is this playing out for you at the 92nd Street Y? So from a practical perspective, I wanted to talk about three things that we've seen effective so far in terms of trying to be a blended power organization. Uh, the first is we built an innovation team at the Y built entirely of our existing staff. So rather than looking outside at the world and hiring fancy new people, we invested in people inside the organization and we freed them up from daily responsibility so they could try to do a lot of new and different projects. That proved very effective. Number two thing we did, which really worked out well, was we hired a, co a collaboration director. So we have someone whose whole job it is to work uh, on how we can work better with other organizations. So take some of the things we're doing and help build that and build movements around the organization. That really helped too. And the third thing we did, which was really constructive and might be helpful for some people in this room, was got some board allies. We got some board allies who were people who really understood this kind of work and started to let them tell the story of where the organization is going. And with those three interventions over a couple of years, we started to shift some expectations around how the organization is thought of. Uh, it's very early days for us and we still as an institution face a lot of challenges. I, I don't want to give anyone the idea that any of this is easy, but the one thing I would say is we've never tried an experiment that we didn't at the very least learn a lot from. And actually more of them than I thought have really worked out.
So one of the big lessons for us from a takeaway perspective is we need to empower our staff and, and us as leaders, as all the people in this room as leaders. One of the questions I think we always have to ask ourselves is to what extent are we giving our staff permission to try some of these new things, which are so high risk in some ways, because we know and we don't know how they're really going to work. So to finish up today, I thought I'd talk about three big opportunities um, that I would see, especially for the foundation world, as we think about new power. Uh, so the first, let's do a quick exercise. Who here can explain to me what the SDGs are? All right, a handful of, handful of goals. All right, so the Sustainable Development Goals, right? So the world's leaders are coming together this September to set the global agenda for the next 15 years. Who here can explain to me what an API is? Okay, four or five hands, good. Who here can explain to me both what the SDGs are and what an API is? <laughs> Only Larry Kramer. Larry Kramer <laughs> and Jacob Hartley. So, here is number one big opportunity, I think, for the foundation world. There is a disconnect right now, right? There is a disconnect between those people who are spending their time very deeply and thoughtfully making the world better. Let's call them the SDG people. Right? They understand how the world is changing, they understand the biggest world challenges, yet there is a disconnect from those people and the people who understand technology the most. So one of the opportunities, I think, for the foundation world is how you fill that middle gap. How your organization can be an organization that both understands the SDGs and understand the APIs. Because the people who... Could, API, API, thank you. Um, and the API is an application program interface. It's the way in which you design software so other people can build around it, right? So it allows you to open up software for other people to design. So the API world and the SDG world need to get closer together. There's a big opportunity right in the middle of that for foundations. Opportunity number two for foundations. So this uh, is the Red Umbrella Fund, and it's a uh, foundation who gives its money away to support some of the challenges sex workers have, but what they've done is put together a funding board which is 80% sex workers themselves. Right? So the money being given out is not being given out by grant managers, it's being given out by the recipients of the cause. So one of the things we've heard a lot about in the last couple of days is how great feedback loops are. Right? We want to have more feedback, we're all going to listen better, we're going to hear the voices better, but those conversations don't really shift the power dynamic. One of the challenges and opportunities ahead, I think, would be to think about the feed-in loops. Right? So how are you designing feed-in loops? How are you designing ways where people can actually come and build movements around the ideas you care about? Uh, third idea, particularly true here in Silicon Valley. So this is an image of a kind of uh, a secession, really. It's a, an idea of people who are going to build a new world off the coast of Silicon Valley and start anew. Such are the problems of the old power world that we must disrupt it and hack away and off we go. Um, there is a big debate happening right now around the systems and the structures of how our society functions at a fundamental level. And we as a philanthropic community have to be in and we have to be leading that debate in a very meaningful way. So this part of the world is a part of the world defined so often by exits, right? We are all dreaming here of the big exit from our business. Uh, it is time for us to shift that narrative away from a conversation which is all about exits and towards a conversation that is about an entrance. And that entrance to a world of civil society that actually bridges some of this technological thinking, it bridges some of the best thinking in the, in the philanthropic space, it brings government in together. The people in this room are uniquely positioned to reimagine what civil society looks like from its roots and make profound, meaningful change. Because one of the things you'll hear often out here in Silicon Valley is the great challenge of our generation is can we connect the world with more technology? I'd finish by arguing something different. I'd argue that the great challenge of this generation is not can we connect the world with more technology, but can we connect the world with greater humanity? Uh, and that, I think, is a challenge set to send us off for lunch. Uh, thank you. <laughs>